The Syriza government has just signed up to a new bailout agreement. This bailout agreement um, is a very bad deal. And it's a very bad deal for clear reasons which I will enumerate. First of all, the agreement is recessionary. It's going to make the Greek economy go into recession because tax increments alone, annually, come to 2% of GDP. This tax imposition is mostly on um, VAT, indirect tax, imposed on goods consumed by uh, mostly the laboring layers of the population. Taxes have also been increased on enterprises, and they're going to hit small and medium businesses primarily, which are the backbone still of the Greek economy. Taxes have also been imposed on agriculture, and they're probably the most severe increase in taxes, doubling the income tax for farmers and imposing a raft of other obligations on them. So there's no question these measures are recessionary and they're taken exactly at the moment when the Greek economy is teetering over the edge of recession. So it's going to be tipped into recession, for sure. Second, the deal imposes measures which are clearly unequal. They're going to intensify inequality in this country. Don't let anyone tell you that these measures will not exacerbate inequality in this country because, of course, the bulk of tax revenue will come from indirect taxes, which are, by definition, inequality-inducing. Inequality will also increase because the measures will take away 800 million euros annually from pensions. So they will impose a significant burden on pensioners who are typically among the poorest uh, layer in the, uh, layers in the population. Inequality will also increase because, of course, unemployment will again rise this year and next. The measures and the agreement is also bad because it will do nothing for the national debt. There is no restructuring of the debt. There is a replacement of some of the debt denominated under some category into another. There might be some marginal benefit in terms of interest rates and duration of the debt, but that is marginal. And debt will definitely increase by 20 to 25 billion to recapitalize the banks. The IMF expects debt to GDP ratio to go up to 200% next year, and that is so. That is most likely what is going to happen. Fourth, the measures will do nothing for development. There is nothing developmental in these measures. The so-called package of 35 billion euros doesn't exist. These are monies that already have been allotted to Greece in the various funds of the EU. There's no new money in this. We don't know when it will accrue and how to Greece. There is no developmental angle to this. Finally, the deal is quite clearly neo-colonial. The government of the left has signed up Greece to a neo-colonial agreement. And it is, it is neo-colonial for, for many reasons. I will mention three. The first, the deal proposes the establishment of, of a privatization fund of 50 billion euros, which will basically sell public property under foreign management. 25 billion of that, the first 25 billion, will go to the banks by the agreement. If there's anything left, and there won't be anything left, because they'll never make 50 billion, it might go to repaying the debt and possibly to investment. Essentially, then, this fund will sell what it can of public property to recapitalize the banks. We've just agreed the deal that sells the family silver 
to recapitalize the failed Greek banks. We've also agreed to reforms of civil administration managed by the EU. We've also agreed to monitoring, and this monitoring will be very severe, and it will last a lot longer than the three years that this deal will last. To me, this deal, as it stands, represents a disastrous capitulation. This is not Brest-Litovsk. Those of you who think that this is Brest-Litovsk uh, are making a mistake. This is not gaining time to establish Bolshevik power in Moscow and Leningrad. This is not, this is not gaining time. There's no time to be gained. Time works in favor of the enemy in this context. And this is not a tactical maneuver. This is putting the country down a path which has only one exit. And that exit is not in the interests of people's rights. The real winner of this deal is obvious. It's staring you in the face. The real winner is the Greek oligarchy expressed in the mass media. That's why the mass media are thriving and celebrating the deal. Sometimes reality is what it appears to be. You don't have to look beyond the surface. If you, read, if you read the big Greek press, and if you listen to the media, you know who has won. Why then? Why this capitulation? Why have we come to this? After all the enthusiasm of six months ago, after all the, the surge of grassroots support in this country and in Europe, why? Why this? The answer is clear to me. And it has to do with the wrong strategy that was good enough to win elections, the triumph over elections, but it proved disastrous in government. Wrong strategy that has collapsed. That's the reason for it. What is this wrong strategy? It's very simple, expressed openly time and time again. We will achieve radical change in Greece, radical change in Europe, and we will do it within the Eurozone. That was the strategy. Well, that's not possible. Period. That's not possible. That's the lesson of the last few months. This is simply not possible. And that's not because of ideology. It isn't a matter of ideology, neoliberal ideology or anything else. And it isn't a matter of ba the balance of political forces. The number of times I've heard of the balance of political forces. And there's a debate now. And there's an argument bubbling up again. Let's wait for the balance of political forces to change in Europe if Podemos get elected. And then things will be new uh, again and different. You'll wait a long time, a very long time, because things are not going to change that way. Why? Because the monetary union in which, to which Greece belongs is not ideological. I mean, it is, but it isn't just ideology, and it isn't just the balance of forces. It is an institutional mechanism. The sooner the Greeks understand this, the better for all of us. It is an institutional mechanism. It is a monetary union. It's a, it's a hierarchical body that works in the interest of big business and in the interest of a few countries within it. That's what the EMU is. It's a failed monetary union, historically. And the failure is manifest in the case of Greece. Greece has been ruined by the monetary union. And the more it clings on, to its membership in the union, the more it destroys its own people and its own society. This is a very long established thing in the history of monetary unions. It's just that every time people refuse to say it. Let me, allow me a digression on the question of money, since this is an academic audience. And since, and since on this issue, lots and lots of people have spoken in Greece, allow me a digression, because I've spent more than 30 years studying money. Now, Money, I believe, is, of course, the universal equivalent. It's the commodity of commodities. I am quite old-fashioned in that regard. Now, in its purest and simplest form, it's a thing. It's a thing. So most people understand gold as money. And sometimes it still is. When it is a thing, it operates blindly and automatically like all things do. 
and it, it's the object of reification. Social relations become embodied in that thing. Blindly, mechanically, society subjects itself to the thing. We've known that for a long time. Keynes called it the slavery of the yellow metal. Of course, modern money is not a thing in that regard. It still is a thing, but not a thing in the form of a produced commodity. The peculiarity of modern money is that it is managed. That is often not understood. It is managed. It remains money, but it is managed. It is managed by institutions, by committees, by mechanisms, by a whole hierarchy of relations, on top of which the, the money that you use sits. What happens in that hierarchy, in that framework, is a reification, all right? But a reification not the same as for gold. What becomes reified in those institutions is the practice. You have a reification of the practice. So ideology and class interest becomes reified in the practice, in the institution itself. That's what the left has failed to recognize in Europe and in Greece. The, me the mechanisms of the European Monetary Union are a ratified class practice. That's what they are. You can't change them because you've, got, you've won a vote in Greece. It's impossible to do. You can't change them because you'll get Podemos in Spain. It's not possible to do. Either you break the whole thing or you accept it as it is. And that has been shown beyond doubt. But the real question here is now what? All this is analysis. Now what? What do we do? Let me tell you, and here my own practice stands for proof. The only consistent position in Parliament <clears throat> the last couple of days, consistent with two things. First, the electoral mandate the series I received on the 25th of January. Second, with a referendum that said no, very clearly, no to bailouts, very clearly beyond doubt. The only consistent position in Parliament with these expressions of popular will was to say no. No was the consistent answer, not yes. <laughs> this is not a matter of moral conscience. I respect the moral conscience of everyone. I understand the moral difficulty of every single member of parliament and every single member of Syriza and everybody else in Greece. This isn't a matter of morality. I'm not suggesting for a minute that no has superior morality to yes. I want to make this clear. It isn't a matter of morality. It's a matter of political judgment. Politics is what matters. And the right political course was to say no. It's the only course that can maintain the consistency that I mentioned with popular will, with what we've said to the people, and what, with what we're likely to do in the future. Now, yes, it's likely to lead to very great problems if it is followed. Very great problems for the reasons that I've explained to you when I indicated what the bailout contains. It will not be possible to change Greece domestically while accepting the bailout agreement. It will not be possible to do it because the bailout agreement already contains very severe monitoring mechanisms. These people abroad are not stupid. They know exactly what the score is. And they will impose conditions, regulations, monitoring patterns that will preclude Syriza from making any changes in the direction that a lot of people wish it to make. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. They are already demanding that much of the legislation that we passed the last five months, much of the legislation that we passed the last five months in the interest of working people is withdrawn. And that's what we're gonna do. They are forcing us to do it. And you imagine that you can pass more radical legislation from now on, which planet do you live on? That's impossible. It will not be possible. Now, what do we do then? What we need to do is to withdraw our consent to this agreement, to withdraw our consent to this agreement, and to 
redesign a radical program that is consistent with our values, our aims, and what we've told to the Greek people all this time, all these years. And that radical program is impossible without Euro exit. The only thing that we really need to do is focus on developing a plan for Euro exit that will allow us to implement our program. It is so obvious, I'm amazed that people still don't see it after five months of failed negotiations. Now, do we have the forces for this? We do. We do because the referendum, which said no so powerfully, showed two things. The first thing that it showed is that the euro is a class issue. It isn't some impersonal form of money. As I said to you, it crystallizes and encapsulates class relations. And people have instinctively understood it. The rich voted yes, the poor voted no in the referendum, period. <laughs> the second thing that the referendum showed, and that's a massive change, the first time we've seen this during the last five years is that the youth of Greece have at last spoken. Most of us have been waiting for the youth to say something. Something. And it did. That youth that is so European in outlook, so educated, presumably so far away from all these dinosaurs of the extreme left that believe in Marx and all these other people, that youth of Greece that travels on Erasmus programs and goes here and there and everywhere, 80% of it said no. And that is the basis for a radical line, for a different line for Syriza today. And if we say yes, and if we maintain the yes, we will lose the youth, I'm sure of it. I haven't got much time, so I'll push on very quickly. How do we devise then this new position? Is it impossible to do? Well, a plan exists. You mustn't think that there hasn't be, there's been no plan of how to exit the, uh, this disastrous monetary union and implement a radical strategy. A plan exists. It's just never been used and never been developed, never been further studied. The plan needs developing. And the plan needs political will. Above all, what it needs is political will to be implemented. The plan, in the form of a roadmap, will contain a few very clear things. First, default on the national debt. The weapon of the poor is default. Greece must default on its debt. There is no other way out. The debt is crushing it. So default on the debt as a first step to achieving a deep write-off of the debt. Second, nationalization of the banks. Effective nationalization of the banks. <laughs> when I say nationalization, I mean appoint a public commissioner and a group of civil servants, selected civil servants, with some technocrats who know what to do and take over the running of the bank, the banks and ask all public management to go home, the private management to go home. That's what needs doing. No ifs and buts. And the legal structure must be, must be changed accordingly. It's very easy to do. The Greek banks at the moment have got majority um, share ownership, which is public basically. They need to be turned into uh, normal shares and then that's it. The banks must continue under bank and capital controls, half the job of exiting this disastrous monetary union has already been done. But properly operating bank and capital controls, not this ramshackle affair that we've witnessed the last two weeks. Properly functioning bank and capital controls that would allow working people and small businesses to start functioning again. It's perfectly possible. Perfectly possible, we've seen it time and time again. Next. Conversion of all prices, conversion of all obligations, conversion of all money stocks at the rate of one to one uh, to the new currency. Anything under Greek law can be converted. Those who hold deposits will lose some purchasing power, not nominal value, but some purchasing power, but they will gain because the purchasing power of what they owe in debt will also decline. 
So the majority of people will probably gain from this. Next, organize the supply of product markets, oil, medicine, and food. Perfectly possible to do with an ordering of hierarchies, so long as you start doing it a little while ahead, not at the last moment. Because obviously, if you're thinking of doing this on Monday morning, and the first you thought of it was Sunday night, it's going to be difficult, yes. I agree. And finally, decide how to take the pressure on the exchange rate, how to operate with the exchange rate. The exchange rate is probably going to dip, then going to rise again. That's typically what these things do. And it's going to stabilize to some kind of devalued rate. I'd expect 15 to 20% devaluation um, at the final position. Decide how to defend that and how to handle it. What will happen if we take this path? And if we take this path after working it out, technically, but above all, preparing the people, because without the people it's impossible. Actually, that's not true. It's also possible to do without the people. It's possible to do with the tanks in the streets. It's possible to do that too. But obviously, that's not the way of the left. The left wants to do it with popular participation, because we want to free the people in that way. We want them to make partners in this. So what will happen, then, if this path is followed? Let me say that I've seen some simulations and some econometrics of what is likely to happen to GDP, to prices, and so on. They're very useful, these things, and very interesting to read at times. But on this occasion, by definition and construction of the case, they are valueless. Why? Because simulation or econometrics essentially assumes, typically simulation more than econometrics, essentially assumes that the structural features of the model, whatever it is, are maintained. Otherwise, you can't do the simulation. Here, by construction, we're changing <laughs> the structure. You understand? By construction, we're doing that. It's a regime break. Or to put it differently to you, how can I possibly foresee the effects of someone who will start cultivating again his vineyard? Because that's what's going to happen. So it's going to be a structural change. So any kind of assessment, of numerical assessment of what's likely to happen ahead is not worth very much. So don't believe the people who tell you there's going to be a recession of 25%. There's going to be a contraction of GDP of 50%. They don't know anything. That's just a number they take out of hat. I will. I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you what I think. The best we can do in, this, in these circumstances is come to a reasoned guess on the basis of pre previous experience and on the basis of the structure of the Greek economy. My guess is that if we follow this path in a prepared way, the way that I've been discussing it, we're going to go into a recession. That would be difficult. That would probably last several months. At least the downward slope would last several months. I don't think it will last more than six months, judging by monetary uh, experience. In Argentina, in Argentina the, the, the downside lasted three months. And then the economy picked up again. So. The contractionary aspect will last several months, and then the economy will pick up. Positive rates of growth might take longer to appear because the blow to consumption, the uncertainty, um, the blow to small and medium businesses is likely to be significant. I'd expect positive rates of growth overall to begin to materialize after about 12 to 18 months. Once that period of adjustment is over, then I'd expect the Greek economy to return to fairly rapid rates of growth in a sustained way. The reason? Two reasons for that. First, the reconquering of the domestic market. Changing the currency in this way would allow the Greek productive sector to reconquer the domestic market, to recreate uh, opportunities and activities, something which we've seen time and again whenever you have um, monetary events of this scale, and with the left government, this will be fostered. 
this will make to go uh, faster and in a more successful way. Partly because exports are also likely to pick up. Partly because there will be a sustained program of public investment to boost also private investment and to lead to um, growth uh, for, for years ahead. Now, that's what I think. I haven't got time to go further into it. I want to say two more things. This is no exit from Europe. No one is advocating exiting Europe. The conflation of the, the euro and the euro, European Monetary Union with Europe, this disembodied good that has been bedeviling us for a long time, doesn't exist. Here we're talking about exiting the monetary union. Greece will remain very much part of Europe and of the European structures as long as the Greek people wanted to do so. Um, this is a strategy instead for freeing Greece from the trap of the monetary union and allowing it to enter a path of sustained growth with social justice that will tip the social balance in favor of the laboring people of this country. There is no other strategy. I'm sorry to say, but to think that there's another strategy is to, is to, engage, to engage in a wild goose, in a wild goose case, chase. There is no other strategy. Now, I finished here. Now, I don't know if Greece will do that. There is a saying which I've come across recently which is very interesting. Apparently it goes back to an Israeli prime minister. And it says that nations take the road to wisdom, the road of wisdom, but only after trying every other road before that. <laughs> and in the case of Greece, I'm afraid that this is what we've got in front of us. The road of wisdom is the road of exit with social change. I hope that Syriza will see the point, that he will say no, that he will not sign up to this agreement, that will go back to its radical principles and radical values, that he will make a new offer to Greek society and take it down the road of wisdom. Thank you. Okay, we're, go we're, we're going to steal, wait, 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 wait. We're gonna steal some time from the next sessions. We'll take a few questions from the audience. I'll speak for 15 minutes, no. And, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna give the panel one, you know, a couple of minutes each too. And I, I'm, I'm sorry that we can't, we, we just, we can't do more, but we'll, we'll try to do something. Okay. Uh, we, have, we have one right here, Sam. Okay. Cheers. Thanks for the presentation. My name is Gal from Ljubljana, United Left. Um, one question for Kostas for the last intervention. I very much embrace uh, withdrawal from the Eurozone, not just for Greece, but for the whole periphery, so and to reconstitute some kind of socialist Europe. Uh, what the question is that we know now how blunt the neocolonial, let's say, European constitution is. Uh, we should have in mind that when Greeks will decide, right, let's hope they will decide for Euro, Euro exit, um, there will be, of course, certain reprisal policies. There might be embargo also on Greece. So this is quite uh, like one thread that is quite real. Secondly, yes, yes. Secondly, um, if you could talk a little bit more about the alternative credit sources. Every plan has to have it. So when you say cancellation of the debt, and then you say also goodbye for Troika, you have to talk, OK, maybe it's South America, maybe it's BRICS, and so on. So that's just your opinion on that. OK, thank you. And we'll, we'll, again, please try to keep it short. Uh, the woman with the red hair.
Can you wait one second so we can get you a mic? Hello. Right, my name is Lisa McKenzie. I am a working class English person, so I know about subjugation for the vilest people probably in Europe, the English conservatives. Um, the, this panel is called The End of the World as We Know It. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to say arguably no, it's not, especially if we start to think about the first three speakers, their class, their gender, um, and their occupation and the language that they used. That is not the language of working class people. I've got a question. So my question is, how are, you go how are you going to connect with working class people throughout Europe? Okay, what, one more question. Uh, uh, Presto, you've got the mic, can you? Okay, I promised this guy over here, hold on. Okay. Uh, I will ask the question quickly, but the sister's quite right in terms of how we organize if we want to change the world. The sister is absolutely right. And a fantasma planietes in Europe. A spectre is haunting Europe. Not my words or my sentiment, the words of Karl Marx and Engels, the sentiment of Donald Tusk this morning, who said that he feared that Europe was in a post-1968 moment because radical leftists like Kostas, Lapovitsas, who I entirely agree with from the uh, platform, is saying that there's an alternative. My question is this. Where do we see the strategic impasse of the Syriza government? Is it in a lack of capacity of people to fight? The Ochi vote tells me no. The charity strike of hospital workers in Berlin tells me no. The Irish non-payment campaign of the water uh, charges tells me no. If you talk about lack of preparedness to fight of the labor bureaucracies, of the Parti Socialiste, of the SPD, of Steinbrück, of the leaderless labor party in... I've asked the question and I'm, I'm asking one second, one second point, one second point. This is democracy in action. This is democracy in action. The question is, are you going to look, are we going to look above or to below? And my direct question, in addition to that, more concretely, on the panel, are you with, in the Bundestag today, the 63 Die Linke MPs who said no to the Carthaginian peace, or are you with the CDU, SPD, uh, the Grünen, and all the rest who are imposing this misery on Greece in the name of Alexis Tsipras? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Leo. Leo. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to uh, be asking a question of, uh, of course, of Kovitas also. Uh, I'm not neglecting the, the rest of the uh, of the panelists, but I have a question which is, is an honest question, Professor Kovitas. I don't know anything about money, and I don't know anything about economy, but I need to, I need to understand this. From what I understand, what is happening right now is an experiment, right? What is happening in Greece? And in terms of the, and in terms of the, uh, of what happened with the referendum and the new bailout is an experiment. And as you were speaking, I counted actually eight times that you used the word probably, and another twelve times that you used the word perhaps. So my question to you is this: Do you actually know what will happen any better than the government does? Or are you also thinking about indifferently, you know, dialectically opposite to what the government does? So, do you know what will happen? Do you know how long the recession will be? Do you know how many people will suffer? Do you know what will happen with their money? And just one piece, one piece of information, because my family has gone back to farming, and I can tell you we have 40 stremata of olive groves, which give us, uh, per year, 3,000 euros. And this is money that we get by selling it to the American market, which means that we can actually sell for 17 liters of oil. Instead of 50 euros that we would be selling it in Greece, we sell it to the United States for $350. So if you think, do you think that this is money that, this is something, this is a model that people who have 
uh, uh, family uh, land outside of Athens can actually go back to, and is this an economic model which is sustainable? This is a moment of question. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry about the time and thanks for the patience. We're going to try to get a, a few very quick answers and this is obviously going to continue for a long time. Okay, Leo. Uh, I very reluctantly enter into this as someone who's not Greek, but I have to say this. I think Kostas is completely right. Uh, he's right, but uh, the Syriza as a party, as a political force, is not unified behind this. And insofar as it's not unified behind this, following this strategy will break this political force. So, so, the timing is not right. And the timing is not only not right because of the balance of forces in Syriza. It's also not right because the balance of forces in the state, in the structure of the state, and the balance of forces in the economy, both of which are linked by clientelist structures, are such that if you move now, the risks that have been identified in terms of increasing the gray and black markets, etc., will multiply. That said, Costas is right. He's right in the sense that five months have been wasted, not in devising an alternate strategy. Five months have been wasted in not building the capacities of the non-commodified egalitarian forces in the state and in society to link together and build the strength to carry through the necessary project that Costas is describing. Let me give you just one example and then I'll shut up. I spent some time this week with people from Solidarity for All. They came to the Department of Agriculture asking for an outline of where crops are grown in Greece. They would go to different farmers within, given that map, and try to get the broad range of foods that are necessary to facilitate the distribution of food in a direct manner with the farmers. The Department of Agriculture, they were only asking for the data. The Department of Agriculture said we don't have it. If they don't have it, they were reluctant then to put in the days they needed to construct it. What one needs instead is a reorganization of the state that facilitates the capacity that has already been developed in the solidarity networks, but is obviously limited, constrained, local, to be generalized. If that is however you embark on a move now, in a divided Syriza, in a state that is, reflects that Department of Agriculture, in a solidarity movement which have not been strengthened so they offset the inevitable black markets and gray markets, then you're moving too fast. That's the problem of time, of, of disaggregated time that you find yourselves in. Not something external, but something internal. I'm really happy that uh, my friend and colleague from London, Costas, did not come up with some of the usual things we've been listening in the last few days about betrayal, about capitulation, about selling out. The kinds of things that will bring this party and this movement and this government and this hope and expectation that the whole Europe and European people have here in Greece and that is why you're here. So therefore, Costa spoke the language of the economist. And the language of an economist is a language of comparison and calculation. And he told us, and I'm very happy to accept, what would happen if in a control process we were to leave the euro. And then yesterday we were here when the Minister for Education told us that if we were to leave the euro, there would be no water in the islands. And Costa, my friend, spoke in the past about rationing food and pharmaceuticals and energy. And what I'm saying is that when we compare those two things, we're not talking here about high principle. Costas 
is not more a leftist than I and I think everyone else on this table is. And I have to insist on that. Sure, 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 sure. That's why I said that we didn't say it, and that's why we're happy about that. Right. Okay. But if we're led into a situation where the living standards of the people have already fallen by 40, 45 percent, and they take another hit of another 20 or 25 percent, Costas now says for three months. But of course, Quite rightly, he said he cannot be sure. It may be a year, it may be two years, it may be forever. Can a left government that has on it the hope of the Greek people and of the Greek left and of the European left, can it take that risk? And my answer in pure economic and risk theory terms is that it cannot. It could be, it could be, perhaps I would say, the longest suicide note in the history of the left. Don't say what they are Thank you very much. So that is that is not an argument. That is not an argument. Don't say what they are Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, thank you very much. Oh, I, we, we, let me finish. Let, let, let me finish. Please, please. Let me finish. Let me finish. Wait, wait. This is... Let's continue. We've got to end. We've got to get out of... We've, we're 45 minutes over. We're going to let him finish very quickly and then give most a minute to respond. Wait, wait. Yes. He will, he will speak. So the time is out of joint as... Uh, as Leo just said, and let me finish with one sentence. Yes. If okay. this government survives with the help of our colleagues and comrades from the left platform, we have to remember what all of us were saying earlier, but suddenly we introduce a few figures and we forget it. Now there is a huge movement in Greece. The women are voted now, and the movement and the party will be critical to the government if the government does not introduce new measures that move in a social just way. We have to escape to the future. Okay. Okay. okay whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, 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 wait. Costa, just a second. You can yell at. Wait, wait. You can yell at him later after we're done here. Costa. No, no. It costs. We're giving. We're giving. I'm sorry. Costa. Costa. We've been asked to leave the room, and I'm going to give Costa a minute to answer the question. Okay, okay, okay. So we've come to... Let me say first of all, and as I say, I, I say this from the position of President Peters, that no one wants to split citizens. Certainly no one from the left wants to split citizens. There is no force that is more serious than the left platform. The left platform is serious. It's the original force that created it. So, this, this, this is not some kind of interlope. And no one wants to uh, split Syriza, no, no one wants to, to see the government fall. This is a vote. This is a government that must Okay, good. Next, next. Can I just, can I just make a point? Like, like, look, look. No one wants to divide Syriza. No one wants to split it. This is not an argument about making the government fall. This is an argument about whether we will accept bailouts and bailout conditions against which we've fought for five years. That's what has created Syriza.
we want, we want the government and Syriza to go back to what made it what it is. Now, on my seat, I've been asked about my seat by the lady over there and by many others. Let me explain, let me explain a couple of things about my seat. First of all, I was elected by the people of Imathia. But the democratic mandate I've got is from the people of Imathia. I was the first MP, top of the list. They voted me. I wasn't voted in by, by, by Syriza institutions. I was voted in by the people because I went and visited every village, every town, every coffee shop in the area, and, and people voted for me. That's the first thing to say. Second, I did sign, I did sign a code of conduct. I did. Syriza asked me to sign a, co a code of conduct, and I take it very seriously. No one has asked me to resign yet. No one has asked me to resign, because presumably I'm breaking the code of conduct. <laughs> Why not? Why have I not been asked to, to, to resign on the basis of the code of conduct? Because I've not broken the, con the code of conduct. The code of conduct says I've got to comply with collective decisions. Which collective decision said we've got to accept the bailout agreement? None! the decision to sign the bailout agreement? When did the party organs meet? Who, who, when? When that happens, when that happens, when there's a collective decision, then yes, I will take it very seriously and I will reconsider and I will feel, I will feel obliged to follow the, the code of conduct. Not yet, not until then. It's not an issue of morality, so don't force me to start dealing with moral issues. Don't do that. You're not going to win. On morality, you're not going to win. I haven't raised the issue of morality. So please, don't let anyone raise the issue of morality in here. You're not going to win, I assure you. It's a matter of politics. This is a political decision, and I made a political case here, not a moral case. Now, there's only one more point that I want to make. Do I know better than others? Eco trip. Do I know better than um, everybody else? I was asked a personal question. I will answer it in the first name, in the first person. I'm sorry, I can't answer it in the third person. That would have made it the royal we, and I, I don't really want to do it. But anyway, do I know better? No, I don't. I don't know better than others. I've got a track record. You can find it for yourselves. But I don't know better than others. I didn't predict. I haven't predicted. I told you what analysis, my analysis says. That's the best I can do. I presented it to you. You draw your own conclusions. I am not trying to tell you that I know and the government doesn't. I'm telling you that my political analysis and my analysis of the economic situation is, says something else. And I expect bad things to happen if we go down that, the path of the bailout. And I think that if we don't, better things will happen. That's the best I can do. It is for activists, it is for voters, it is for the people to decide, and I hope they do it as quickly as possible because the times are indeed critical. Thank you. Thank you. We need to make okay. Thanks, everybody.